Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Walk to Wealth podcast. I have a very special guest with me, Kevin. Kevin, for anyone that may not know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, who are you and what do you do? Hey, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So I am, I guess I call myself a consciousness accelerator. I am a guide in some ways on kind of the internal landscape. So I help people get to their truth, get to their core of what really drives them. Because a lot of times in life, we're doing a lot of things for other people or we're doing a lot of things because of other people. The programs we got when we were little, the conditioned patterns that we experienced, and then we just kind of slipstream into these channels in life and it's challenging to get out. So I help people realign with, with their, their essence so that we can all live more fulfilling, more peaceful, more centered, more abundant, and more wealthy in every sense of the word lives, not just the monetary. Exactly. And that's exactly what we talk about here on the Walk to Wealth podcast. And before you got into what you're doing now, mm-hmm. now, tell us a little bit about your walk to wealth. Where does the journey all take place? Where does it begin? Well, that's such a great question. So my walk really began my previous career before I, I had a massive connection experience and had all kinds of more natural abilities turn on. I was a designer. I was an interface UI UX designer. So websites, applications, software, touchscreens, kiosk installations, things like that. Anything with a human computer interaction, I would design the interface for. And that was something for me that was lifelong. I knew in seventh grade, I wanted to be a designer. So I went into graphic design and I was taking all kinds of courses and classes around typography. I love type forms, symbolism, Mm -hmm. meanings of symbols and how something Nike, for example, how something as simple as that swoosh can become so endemic and so embedded in culture that no words are even needed. Everybody on the planet pretty much knows what that swoosh means. Mm -hmm. So being able to communicate volumes in, in very succinct ways was always really fascinating. How can we simplify? How can we make it easier? How can we make it easier to adopt? How can we make it more understandable for everyone? I was, so I was doing that for a number of years with, with digital products. And then I was also doing my, my own personal work along the way. And where I'm at now is I'm pretty much doing what I applied to digital products, interfaces, applications, websites to humans, to our human system. So I help people find ways to release old programs, things that don't serve us, traumas or messages that we carry with us because we think we need them for survival, at least our biological system does. And really just come back to that, make it simpler, make it easier, make it more efficient. Yeah, no, definitely when I ask, who are you? You mentioned that a lot of us are have these channels that we happen to find ourselves in based off of what we grew up in and in environments and then what we've heard and been told from other people. And we kind of end up living our lives and it takes some people decades to finally realize like, hey, I've been living this entire life not realizing the life I've been living hasn't yeah. even been mine. I've just been like a pawn in someone else's grand scheme or grand plan because I never took the time to kind of really self-reflect, what is it that I'm here for? What do I have to do? What's my purpose, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can start moving in the right direction. So I think a great place to start this conversation is, you know, what advice would you give or if you have a formula to start, begin living like a truly free life? So for me, it it always began with awareness. So in, in awareness of how I was feeling internally, awareness of where I was feeling things internally. A lot of times in the West, we will assign a label to a thing, to a way we're feeling like my anxiety or or I'm under such stress, or it's my ADHD or it's my OCD. And there's a couple challenges with those. Number one, we are taking ownership of the things we experience anytime we label it mine. So that would be the first thing is, is reflect and become aware of the language we're using for ourselves. What, what am I taking ownership of inadvertently, unconsciously things like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's just up. It's just my, my, my trick knee or my, my, my bum shoulder flaring up again. A lot of times those weak points within the system, it can be physical, mental, spiritual, or emotional. Those are the things that are impacted because we're running other people's programs. So. One is the the awareness, the awareness of our thoughts, the awareness of the way I'm feeling, and then going one step beyond saying, oh, I'm, I, I, I've got anxiety or I'm feeling anxious 
and identifying where in our body we're actually feeling that. How do I, in my hyper-personal expression as a human, feel anxiety? Where is it? Is it, in, is it my digestion gets all, do I get crampy or gassy mm -hmm. or bloated in my intestines? Do I feel like there's a vice clamped around my chest? Do I get just static in my head and I can't have a clear thought? So when we can connect the physical feeling to the thing we're experiencing, then we can do something about it because we've got a, a gauge, the, the actual physical feeling. Mm -hmm. And we can take steps with a host of different practices to bring us back to a balanced state, back to our whole brain state, a balanced left and right hemisphere state, and out of a fight, flight, freeze response, which unfortunately with modern life, so many of us are just submerged in all the time with social media, with comparison, with judgment, with the news, with the way of the world. And so everything's a choice. We can choose to consume these things that maybe get, give us fear, give us stress, give us anxiety, or we can choose to not. So the awareness is number one. And then choice is number two. What, what do I really align with? It's those gut check moments of, oh, I'm, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in Cincinnati. So I'm a bank. My, my family's a Bengals fan. I'm a Bengals fan. It's like, wait, I'm kind of not even into football, but I'm cheering for my team, this team every Sunday. It's like, well, would I rather be doing something else? Mm -hmm. And if we clear out the cobwebs, if we clear out the programs and we get aligned, then we can get a lot truer answers about what really lights us up instead of just kind of doing what we're handed because that's the way that it's been done in our family for however many generations. Yeah, no, definitely. That's an amazing point. And like one of the times I've realized in my life where I, not that I was running on autopilot, but like my grandparents were, because my grandparents raised me and I don't ever get into politics on this show, but my grandparents one time at the last election, I asked them out of curiosity, why do you always vote Democrat? Mm -hmm. And they said, because we always did. <laughs> and that's the, the extent of their thinking. And yeah. it was just because we've always had and yeah. their whole life, they never take the time to break free. And sometimes that's what politics, sometimes that's what other things in life, or maybe it's playing a sport or maybe it's playing an instrument that you never yeah. actually wanted to play. And uh, we end up finding these in situations where it's like, we kind of just been doing things one way because that's always how things have been done. It's kind of hard to break free. I kind of yeah. wanted to ask you about the first point, because with all the noise that we face and hear every single day, you already mentioned some of them, news, social media, other people, your teachers, your whoever it may be. How does one then kind of get the, um, the, the get into the right headspace to properly be able to gain that awareness and actually hear what's going on within when there's so much noise and so much clutter going on at the same time. Yeah. And that's, that's really kind of that, that one, two, that's the two in the one, two punch of awareness and disruption. So step number one is we have to be aware of of the programs we're running, of the conditioned kind of habitual patterns we find ourselves in. That's step one. Without awareness, it's hard to do anything because we just don't have insight into what the thing is that was controlling us or influencing us. So awareness, number one. And then when we gain awareness, we can disrupt those patterns. If there's, any, there's something called a whole brain exercise, and it's really simple exercises where we're crossing the midline of the body. So this is where we get into kind of the electromagnetic nature of our biosystems, of our bodies. So every single one of us is bioelectric and we actually produce energy. If anybody's seen the movie, The Matrix is mm -hmm. really well illustrated in how much energy we produce. So at rest, an average person, if we were to hook ourselves up and have a way to do it, we could, we could power a desk fan, back and forth, nice desk fan. A trained athlete at peak performance, peak, ex peak energy expenditure, peak sprint mm -hmm. is producing and expelling enough energy to heat an oven to 350 degrees. So we have a ton of energy naturally. The challenge is that so often this energy is directed towards survival programs, survival mechanisms within the body. And so more often than not, we are, we are in some type of a latent fight, flight, freeze response. Mm -hmm. So when we do a whole brain practice where we cross the midline of the body and it's, it's a little bit like rubbing your tummy and tapping your head yeah. where we want to give our brain. So there's a thumbs up and a pointer one. So if we try and alternate and speed that up, yeah, that's, so we're, we're training our brain to be almost bilateral. 
Yeah. There's something called, and a lot of these are brain gym exercises that kids do in an elementary school or in daycare and sometimes in Montessori. And it's something as simple as marching in place, tapping our thighs, looking up and to the right for about 20 counts. This is one, two, three, four. And then everything stays the same. You just shift your gaze to the upper corner of the room mm. and you knock that out and you're disrupting the physiological reaction to keep us in that fight, flight, freeze response. We're bringing us back into a balanced hemisphere state. And what happens is when we get dropped into that limbic system, that, that animalistic, that lizard brain, the kind of the monkey mind, mm -hmm. the corpus callostrum, which is the connection layer. It's the kind of, it's like a, almost like a, a gel between the hemispheres. It kind of shuts down. And so what happens is we get, do we get dumped into a dominant brain hemisphere. So if we're right brain dominant, we might get a little bit more emotional. We might get a little bit more expressive. If we're left brain dominant, we might get a little more analytical. We might get a little more pragmatic, like, all right, we just need to figure out, let's get it all out on paper. And neither is really a balanced expression, a balanced way, kind of that middle way, if you're familiar with Eastern philosophies and Eastern practices. Mm -hmm. So the disruption gets us back to that balanced state, which clears out that static. And then it, we arrive at the place of choice. Do I want to keep doing the things I've been doing? Do I feel whole? Do I feel good? Do I feel balanced? Do I feel peaceful about what I'm doing? Do I feel excited? Or am I like kind of cringing at the thing I'm about to do? Or is it something where I get balanced and then I realize, oh my gosh, the thing I was about to do, I don't want to do at all. So if we don't get to that kind of balanced state, that peaceful internal state, it's really hard to have choice. So it's really about the awareness, the disruption, and then looking at all of our options, even the ones we might not consider. So say we're considering, let's say we're considering a, a career change and what I'm doing right now just isn't doing it for me. And I'm interested in maybe cryptocurrency. And I'm also interested in social media production, something like that. Mm -hmm. Those are our twos that are on our, on our horizon, but then open that space field up, open that spectrum up and just put down, get out of your head, put it on paper, anything that you might be interested in. Cause we're really good at being singularly focused, single task minded. But when we have too many options in our brain, we can, it, it's called neurological disorganization. So we can get to this place of being over choice. As my daughter used to say, when she was young, it's like, I'm, she says, I'm over choice. I don't want to pick where we're going for dinner. So when we get everything out on the paper, then we can really utilize our system to its strong point and just, okay, falconer. No, that's not, that's not doing it for me. Pro skater. Eh, I'm a little too old. My knees aren't going to take it. And so it just helps to really narrow in on what we do truly want as opposed to maybe what mom or dad say we should do or what our friends are doing or any other influences. You mentioned Eastern philosophy a little bit throughout the time you were talking. Is there any in particular that kind of like really helped you grow and find where you're at now and that really helped you throughout your life? The, the, it was at, probably there's one Eastern and one Western that, that I really resonated with and that mm -hmm. was Taoism okay. and Stoicism. And Taoism was really a good one for me because it, it to me, if, if I could sum it up, it, it arrived, it gets us to the place of maybe, which is a big factor in, in the, in the practice and kind of this approach to living is reducing the amount of meaning that we assign to things we experience. Again, being in that fight, flight, free state, we're quick to assign meaning to everything. It's mm -hmm. good. It's bad. I align with this. Ooh, nope, that's not for me. I hate this. And it really drops us into kind of a, 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 a dual space that's pretty unhealthy. It's that if you're not with us, you're against us mind frame and nothing in, in life is really that black and white. It's, it's spectrums, mm -hmm. it's shades of, of grays, it's different colors all across the spectrum. And so there's a beautiful story, a story of the farmer. Anyway, it's, it's an old story. So it goes mm -hmm. something to the effect of farmer in a valley and he's got a couple horses, storm blows through, knocks the fences down, the horses escape. The rest of the village comes out. Oh, what bad luck. Oh, what misfortune. What will you do? All of your horses have escaped. And the farmer says, maybe. A week later, the two horses come back leading a wild herd of 12. So now he's got 14 horses. Yeah. The entire village comes out. Oh my gosh, what good fortune. What good luck. You've really been blessed. Farmer says, maybe. maybe. I think I heard Next your week, story before. You I, I'll, let you, yeah. I'll, I'll let you keep going. 
Uh, Alan Watts, that's the, that's the name of the, the philosopher I first heard it from. So then the next week, the eldest son is helping to tame the horses and he gets bucked off and breaks his arm. Oh no, the harvest is coming. The entire village comes back out to kind of judge or put their two cents in. Your, your eldest son has a broken arm. What will you do? How will you get your harvest? How will you function as a farmer? Oh, maybe. Week after that, King's guard come to conscribe all of the eldest sons in the village for service in the army. His son can't go because he's got a broken arm. So it's that, it's that middle way without assigning meaning. It's just, it's a thing that happened. And the less we attach meaning to things that happen, the more we can be observational and aware of our internal state of maybe more of, of a reality in the world than our hyper-personal perception of what we think the world is. So that kind of middle way, it really gives that space internally for me anyway, to reduce a lot of the, the meaning we assign to things, reduce a lot of the emotional load that we carry mm -hmm. because we're not judging, we're not comparing, we're not internalizing. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I said those things at that party. And then we think about it for three weeks and we're just like, oh my God, oh my God. And then we talk to somebody else at the party and they're like, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, oh, I, I was such an idiot. Oh, I'm, I, I was such a fool. I'm like, nobody else cares. Everybody's doing their own thing. And yeah. probably thinking the same thing about themselves at different points in time. So it's, it's really coming back to that center. It's kind of like an ego thing because by overthinking, you kind of imply that your presence or whatever you did was that important enough to actually impact whatever in Alpha's lives that was at that party or function or event yeah. enough to keep them thinking about it for yeah. a long a, a duration of time and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And really it's, uh, yeah, it's, the challenge is, and the opportunity, and I, I always look at those as two sides of the same coin, any type of ego reaction is a safety or as a safety program, a program of protection. And so if it's something, if our systems had their way in our modern society, our, our bodies, our, our subconscious mind body is what mm -hmm. I like to call our entire system. Every single one of us would be on some type of mood stabilizer underneath a weighted blanket with a pint of Ben and Jerry's binging Netflix all day long, because then our system knows we're safe. We're not out following our passion. We're not out taking a chance or signing up for something or submitting something or joining a, a 6 a.m. jujitsu class or mm. join, you know, putting our, our hat in the ring for some contest because that's stepping outside of what the system knows. All the system knows is what we've experienced and it creates our reality based on that. And it's largely for our survival. Mm. The other challenge is our system doesn't care about our happiness, doesn't care about our fulfillment. It only cares about our survival. So if we're carrying stress and anxiety, a depression, ADHD, any number of physiological expressions that I just lump into a category of dis-ease, anything out of feeling peaceful, present, non-attached, fulfilled, maybe even if we don't have everything we want, if we can find those things in the present moment, regardless of our external circumstances, it really turns off a lot of these safety programs, which to your point, gets us to that place of opportunity, gets us to that place of, okay, now we can actually take actionable steps that are, that I'm internally aligned with. And if we keep taking those steps that we're internally aligned with, without attachment to the outcomes, without judgment of where we're at, you just keep taking the steps, chop wood, carry water. And then that gets us to the place we want to be. It might not be as, as fast as we perceive because we've kind of been conditioned again in modern society, we can pop a pill, we can have immediate results. Not always the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is a, a, a life practice that we can utilize to, to get us to these places um, yeah. of alignment without that egoic influence or those safety programs. Yeah, and we mentioned one of the things, anxiety a little bit, and actually anxiety it tends to be something that can really paralyze a lot of people. And oh, yeah. it's something that shouldn't because usually anxiety is the things that aren't actually present. It's our thought, our fear towards the future pretty yep. much. And the future is it now. So pretty much we're getting paralyzed from things that aren't even yet in play. And so what advice do you give to people that find themselves in that state where like their ego is, you know, uh, kind of running amok, like running an event. Exactly. Yeah. What advice do you give yeah. there? So number one is disrupt. Again, as soon as we're aware, as soon as we start thinking, and this is, it's the, it's a mind game. It's a brain game we can play with ourselves. It's that internal awareness of our thoughts. 
And a lot of times the awareness comes after we have a thought. The practice is shortening the duration between awareness and recognition. Okay, I'm aware of my internal state, but a lot of things are getting passed, especially when we start and we start the practice. And then we start catching those reactions. We're like, oh, whoa, no, I'm, I'm worrying about something that hasn't even happened yet. All right, that's just my system overreacting to a future thing. So disruption is number one. Oh, sorry, awareness, disruption, that whole package. Number two is recognizing that the majority of the things that pass through the Grand Central Station that is our mind are complete BS. Mm. So, and they've done research on this, about 80 to 85% of our thoughts on any given day are gonna trend towards negative because our system is risk averse. So it wants to give us, oh, this could happen. Oh, that could happen because it wants to keep us fixed and in, in kind of safe. So 80 to 85% of any given, on any given day are going to be negative thoughts. And then about 95% of our total thoughts are going to be repetitive in some way. So in my own practice, once I kind of gained awareness of the, of this information, I just called BS on pretty much all of it. So any thought, especially if we're thinking about worrying about the future and anxiety is creeping in, or we're pulling the weight of the past with us, and that's when we can start feeling depressive symptoms. It's just not letting our systems get away with the BS. So recognizing that we are not our thoughts, we are not our reactions, and we are not our emotions, but those are things we do experience because of the conditioned system in which we reside, in which we live, our bodies. That perspective shift really helped me gain that space in my mind to really start having a bit more view of the thoughts I was having about myself, about others, about the state of the world, about what I was doing. So recognizing that a majority of stuff were, that, were, that is in our head isn't real and it's just our system trying to keep us safe and we are not those things really were the tools that helped me to get into that practice of awareness and disruption and then awareness and disruption and then identifying what really makes me feel peaceful, present, whole, inspired, what lights me up. Mm -hmm. And then we have the space to go after those things. So then let me ask you, because you, you mean, you're probably familiar with all these books such as Think and Grow Rich and all these other books about mindset. And you're saying that we're not our thoughts, we're not our beliefs, we're not all these things. What if we're intentionally feeding our minds positive, successful ideas? Then that's the opposite. You know, now are, are we still not our minds, not our beliefs, mm -hmm. not our things? What, what's your advice there? So what I found yeah. as I was doing the work at the subconscious level, as I was eliminating a lot of these programs that I, that weren't even mine and really deep seated beliefs, like, um, uh, as far as like things like with money blocks or financial abundance blocks, I'm like, no, I, I want to, I want to be financially well off. I want to be financially stable, but I was having subconscious beliefs that were acting counter to that. So it was really getting in and doing that work, which created more space. So my thoughts really slowed the volume of the thoughts I would have on any given day really diminished. And it was just more, I was more in alignment and I was more open to, okay, I know where I want to go. And I was creating more of a relationship with my internal knowing, with my intuition. And I was asking my system more questions as opposed to thinking I knew, to your point, like thinking I knew the answer. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, you're going back to that, that stoicism and kind of the, the Greek philosophy. Socrates was walking around Athens and he went to every artisan and every master. And he was asking who the smart, who's the most wise, who's the smartest person in Athens. And he was looking at all these masters of their craft to get more information. He goes to the Oracle of Delphi. He asks that question, well, who is the most, who's the smartest person in Athens? And the Oracle says, well, you are, and I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. And then he says, but how can I be? I know nothing. And so being at that place of openness of that beginner's mindset really gives us that space and opportunity to invite those things in. So we're operating from a knowing as opposed to a thinking. So we're open and curious, okay, what's my next best step in this trajectory, whether it's professional, personal, spiritual, or emotional, internal, whatever it is, what's my next best step? And then staying open and curious. Again, this is really, this really type of inquiry needs to be done in a balanced state. So getting to that space of openness and clarity, stopping thinking and being open and curious is 
as far as like, what am I most aligned with? Or if we already have that alignment, we already know the direction we're going. What is my next best step to get to where I want to be? And then being open to what information we already know on the inside, but we might not quite admit to ourselves because we think our answers are still outside of us. So while we're on the topic of philosophy, can you tell us a little bit more about like stoicism? I'm familiar with the term. I've seen people who would be called stoic and I'm kind of familiar mm -hmm. with their traits, but I don't know how to describe it myself. So for anyone that doesn't really understand stoicism, but might've seen it around in a YouTube video or a podcast or yeah. whatever, what exactly is stoicism and how does that, how has that helped you in your life? So kind of snapshot Cliff's Notes version. There's a lot, a lot of different aspects, obviously, to both Taoism and Stoicism. Yeah, definitely. But if I was to sum up Taoism as finding that middle way, uh, being in that maybe non-reactive state, I would actually find a lot of parallels with Stoicism as well. It's allow, to me, it's allowing things to be felt, to be experienced internally without as much attachment or reaction to them. So a lot of times we might have like what we would term a dangerous thought or a scary thought, and we run away from it. Mm -hmm. And I like to say there are no bad thoughts. There are no bad emotions. There are no bad feelings. It's all information. It's all more information that we can utilize to gain more insight into mm -hmm. who we are at our core, gain more insight into those programs and conditionings. So it's really about finding that quietness inside, that quietness within our mind, within our bodies, within our spirit. And it's just all, it's allowing, it's allowing other people to live their lives and find their own alignment with, we don't have to control and we don't have to do anything to push our way of thinking or our beliefs or our alignment on anybody else, because we're looking at gaining more radical freedom internally. And that's where we really become more self-directed in my experience. And so both are really powerful practices of getting quiet on the inside, reducing the importance of the things we experience on the outside. We're not assigning meaning. We're not assigning value necessarily to things. We're just allowing. And then we're staying open to, okay, what, what's my takeaway from this? Is this an experience that I want to continue having? Is this an experience that fulfills me, that lights me up? And a lot of times we can get, we can start this practice and we're, we're doing pretty good and we're feeling good. And then we get to a steep climb, like holiday dinner with our family. And to your point, we could have opposing political views. We could have opposing life views within a family. And let's say we're in a fan, our family of origin is just, there's a lot of dis-ease. There's a lot of people walking around that aren't feeling good and aren't feeling whole for themselves. And they're reactive and they're lashing out. Well, it's a choice if we want to continue to go to these events. And then because of the programming, a lot of us think, oh, it's my family. I have to go. But the family we're born into may not be the family that we resonate with as we, as we get older, as we, as we gain more things in life. One of my favorite, oh, go ahead. Yeah. One of my, I don't know if this is where you were going, but everyone talks about the blood thicker than water quote. And it's, it's people exactly don't know where I was going. The, the, the full actual quote of it is the, what is it? The, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Is the full it. quote. And yep. I, I heard this like maybe, I think it was like two years ago or a year and a half ago. And when it hit me, it, it like instantly like boom, because a lot of these sayings that we use, we tend to shorten it to fit our agendas and we take it out of context when in reality, the full meaning of it. And I try to explain this to my family because we have, my family's very traditional, right? It's mm -hmm. like, oh, family is family. That's your family. That's your brother. That's your sister. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And I was trying to explain this to them, which is difficult because I was trying to explain it in Spanish and not everything translate perfectly well. Sure. But I was trying to explain to them that the importance, like the people we choose to be family are so much more important and helpful to our, our overall success, not just professionally, but our, in terms of life, than the people who we were born into. And that just means so much more. And I, it's what... I don't know. We had this connection. I knew that's where oh, yeah. we were going. I felt it, but yeah, that, I, I love that quote. Absolutely. It, that, that, that was just a, yeah, set it up, knock it down. That was perfect. So uh, the one thing you said was more important. And again, it's a, it's assigning meaning, right? Yeah. So the blood of the covenant, the, the connections we make in life, the, the resonance that we have with other individuals or groups. And it's really that kind of, it's like, find your vibe, find your quote unquote mm -hmm. tribe, even though yeah. I don't necessarily like to use those terms, but where do we resonate? 
where is our energetic resonance at? And it's not that maybe the relationships we have with our, our soul family or our, our friend family or whatever form it takes place is more or less important. It's just all contrast for us mm. to experience and then for us to choose our alignment. Does the contrast of, you know, Aunt Betty and Uncle Jim, it's just, we're going to go on this. They're going to be bitching about something. And it's just, it's the same conversation in a different form. And they're just bringing so much tension and stress and everything. Do I want to continue to experience that contrast? Or am I more aligned with the contrast that makes me feel, oh, like I can put my shield down and I don't have to be so on guard and I can just be more of myself without worry of judgment or things like that. So it's just experiencing the contrast and finding alignment and just staying out of that better than, worse than, more important, less important. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times the most important, doing finger quotes here for those that aren't, aren't watching, can be the negative contrast. And again, finger quotes, because there is nothing negative or positive. It's just something to experience. And then we assign meaning to it. And the, me the assigning the meaning is part of the thing that keeps us boxed in in life. Is it? So the more we can stay out of the meaning, the more we can stay in the experiencing and just releasing resistance or attachment to what we either things that, oh, I feel like I need this for my health, my wealth, my survival, or resistance to things that exist in life. The more that we can really release both of those, the more we get back to that middle way. And that definitely. One thing that I learned about being an, a, a realtor is always that, you know, we must detach ourselves from the outcome. and. Anything from in sales, you know, yeah, the most yeah. part, you get a lot of no's, a oh, lot, yeah. a lot yeah. of no's before a yes ever comes about. And so, and even which is anything in life, you tend to go over a lot of trials and tribulations before you ever amount any level of success. And yeah. detaching yourself from the outcome is something that is extremely hard to do because it's like when you put in work or something, and it, it ties kind of into the idea of delayed gratification as well. Yeah. But it's like, yeah. it's difficult because it's something that's very counterintuitive because yeah. we're kind yeah. of doing it. It's not like you're supposed to do it for nothing, but the idea of not expecting anything out of it allows for more to come in. But people yep. can't really grasp their head around that idea. It's like, hey, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not getting anything out of this. It's like, no, you are. You just don't see it yet. It's that awareness. Yeah. Well, it, 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 what is, I think that's a, that's a, a great place to start instead of I'm not getting anything out of this, switching that to what can I get out of this? What can I take of this experience? So I can, and if it's something that, if it's an experience that we don't want, like we, we don't get the deal or we don't get the client, what can, what's my takeaway? So I can do something different. I can do something more effectively, more efficiently, different mm -hmm. communication in order to have a different outcome next time. And you're, you're exactly right. I always like to say a lot of this, a lot of these practices are fairly simple, but not easy mm -hmm. for that exact reason, because we have so much attachment to things outside of us that it's really a process of, of deconditioning, getting back to that, that a lot of us feel like we're not whole and we're missing a piece of ourselves. And in my experience, again, it's just the conditioning and programming that's keeping us in that misinterpretation of our internal state yeah and and that's yeah that's really I, yeah. i'm gonna say another quote too that i like that i've learned is come from contribution and mm -hmm. instead of you kind of mentioned like, what can i take from this lesson it's a, also another thing is what how can i give more what else can yeah. i give am i giving my all am i giving it 110 yeah. 120 percent if i'm yeah. teaching a class am i just charging people the value of the class and giving that value let's say 50 bucks 50 bucks right. worth of knowledge or Am I going to charge as a class or entry fee and then go all in and then add some bonuses and then go over some right. stuff a little bit more and have a QA and a session yes. after like, what more, how much more can I give? And there's a quote that slipped in my mind and it was pretty much the, 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 the paraphrase, the quote, it kind of just talked about pretty much how if we put more value into things, sooner or later, there'll come a time where it's like, we'll be paid more than our time that we give. For yeah. when you're starting off, you have to put in a lot of time to get paid. But then mm -hmm. after a certain point in time, you'll be paid more for your time than you'll know what to do with if you con con continue to come from contribution and provide yeah. value. Absolutely. And I think that works well with kind of a professional to a client in that relationship because we can yeah. help educate our clients 
whether it's home buying, whether it's in real and being a realtor, whatever profession. And then within the profession as well, mm-hmm. uh, we have the ability to share our experience yeah. and share our niche or our expertise. One thing that actually my, my wife, we work together in our company, we were, we were kind of at that place of like, well, there's so much, like we've got so much information in so many different ways that we can really accelerate the return to our own wholeness and get everything we want without sacrificing. And I feel like that's an example that we're getting in spades right now, where we see these titans of industry and these billionaires. And yeah, they're, they're multi-billionaires, but how's their personal life? What's their relationship like with their family, with their kids? What's their relationship like with their C-suite, with their investors? Like, are we, are we really, the way I like to look at it is again, trivial pursuit with all the wedges. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, very successful people will only have one or two wedges in their game piece because they've hyper-focused on that at the cost of everything else. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to say we don't have to sacrifice. We can have it all and find the center and include our, our family and our loved ones or our chosen family. And we can, we can have the time to do it all if we decondition ourselves from that, that kind of hamster wheel of the rat race and feeling like we need to grind and feeling like we need to hustle and, and do all these things and really sacrifice ourselves for where we want to be or what we want to get to. And it doesn't have to, it, that's, it doesn't have to be that way. There are many other ways. There's many paths up the mountain, so to speak. Yeah. And my on this topic, at the time of this recording, my episode that just dropped this week with Vic Manzo, was, mm-hmm. he mentioned that the idea of sacrifice is a bad idea and we have to practice non-sacrifice. And, yeah. and the way he kind of described it, to my knowledge, is pretty much non-sacrificing. If you're choosing something that you love, it's never a sacrifice. And so what's your yeah. idea on this topic of non, non-sacrifice that you kind of already mentioned? Yeah. A lot of times when we're making decisions from that limbic state, mm-hmm. we're, we, we make decisions that box us in. And it's like, oh, well, I got to grind 80 hours a week. I'm going to be, if we've got a family, I'm going to be up before they're up. I'm going to be back after they're asleep. And then we lose that connection. So that's one form of sacrifice. If we find that inner alignment and it can be maybe doing the thing and we're pursuing the thing, but we're going to have a more balanced approach with it. We're not sacrificing. We're, 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 we're having it all in the moment. We're having that abundance. We're having that wealth of more maybe experience than paper money. And to your point, if we're focusing on the present moment, if we're, sh- if we're looking at how I can give back, how I can contribute, and we're doing the work that we are aligned with, then there is no sacrifice. And a lot of this has to do with like the conditioning. We're born into families and our parents may kind of say, based on our family, you're going to be a doctor, a nurse, or a lawyer. Which one is it? And it's like, well, no, I want to be a performance artist, or I want to be a magician, or this, that, or the other. And so that not allowing is really part of this conditioned approach of sacrifice where it's like, oh, you have to do this for your family. If you don't do this, you're going to disappoint your mom or your dad, or you're going to, a a big one is that you're going to disrespect our family or you're going to shame our family. Or our ancestors is another one. All right. There you go. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, well, wouldn't the best way I could honor my lineage is to really get hyper clear on what lights me up, on what fulfills me, where I'm cultivating the natural talents that I've always had. And that can be, it's an entire spectrum. It can be being good with kids. It can be being good with elder care. It can be being really good with numbers or engineering or sports. Like every single one of us has that thing that is just maybe comes easy to us. It might be enjoyable. And so if we, if we combine that that natural talent, that natural proclivity with what really lights us up, to me, that's fulfillment. And when we're fulfilled, we're not sacrificing anything. We're just finding that inner alignment. And so sacrifice tends to come with attachment to things outside of ourselves. Abundance tends to come with inner alignment and acting from the inside out. Because that's another misconception. We, a lot of times we perceive our world as outside in. But from a quantum or energetic standpoint, the reality is that we create our hyper-personal reality from the inside out, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If we believe our world is, is going to hell in a handbasket and it's all falling apart and there's no good in it, then that's more likely what we're going to experience externally. Mm-hmm. 
And so it's shifting from this perception of, I have to sacrifice for somebody, for something, for something outside of myself, recognizing, finding that inner alignment and sharing those things that we've, that we've covered is really the way to do it all without sacrificing, with contributing. I mean, that's an amazing idea. And it reminds me of this time where I spent the day with a billionaire back in, in June, Gary Keller, the founder of my company, Keller Williams, yeah. I had the opportunity to head down to Austin and, you know, te- learn from him. And what he mentioned is, and I kind of talks about this topic, is first creation and second creation and how we all live two lives, right? The mm-hmm. first creation, that's our inner life. That's the life in here and inside, right? And then from whatever we live in here and experience here, whether we realize it or not, because there's a lot of it, it's our subconscious, that yeah. then manifests into the real world, into our, our physical life, right? Yeah. And there's a quote this one rapper said that ties very well with it, where it's like, where we are now is an accumulation of our past thoughts. So in order to change our future, we have to change our thoughts now. And so that Present kind of, thoughts, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. that idea of we, the life we happen to live out, it's just kind of things that we already experienced and thought of way back yeah. when. And it's kind of doing that awareness, that self-reflection to find, okay, where did this all go wrong? Or if it's going wrong or where does this all go right? And yeah. that alignment and we kind of been talking about alignment throughout this whole episode. How could one really get to that point where they could find, especially as someone young, it, it's very hard because mm. you have a lot of times you have, as I said, sometimes it's not, ta- it's it's talents, but an S at the end. And so you yeah. have things that could pull you in different directions. And how could one kind of find that alignment? So they're, they're not sacrificing, they're being yeah. fulfilled and they're in alignment with what the thing that was their main purpose and what they should be cultivating. So how could we find that, find that alignment when we could have so many different doors and potential opportunities to go down? Yeah. So I, and I love, I love your example. And I like to say nothing's created in a vacuum and nothing's mutually exclusive and everything's connected. And so it, it's not that it has to be mutually exclusive, but again, it just comes back to that. What am I aligning with right now? And it's not to say that we have to keep doing that thing forever. It's finding that present alignment taking a few steps in that direction, which usually tend to be kind of head down. We're in the doing, and then we lift our head up, and then we're back in the being, and then we just check in. All right, is this still, am I still on the trajectory that I'm aligned with? And we can, the best way to do that is is inner inquiry. So get clear, get balanced, disrupt those physiological electromagnetic states that keep us in fight, fight, freeze, keep us out of a clear mind. So we clear all that out, get clear-minded, and then we ask. Because Mm -hmm. again, I mentioned before, the knowing is already on the inside. It's the conditioning and programming that get in the way. It's kind of these layers of of sediment that get in the way of that that treasure that's at at our core. So reconnecting with that core really puts us into that place of inner alignment. So we can have it all by finding that alignment and then creating from that place, moving into creatorship of our lives, making those decisions or choices. And it could, to stick with your example, okay, do I want to, do I want to pursue, let's say I'm going to Juilliard, I'm playing trombone, or I have this opportunity to work with Habitat for Humanity and go across the world. And I'm really attracted to both. And I really, like, I'm really aligned with both, get quiet. And then between these two options, there's, ways that we can actually use muscle testing, physiological kinesiology to inquire using a scale or using a percentage. So if we ask, we can just ask the question straight up, super conscious intuition, super John, super Kevin, or if we have a spiritual practice, universe, source, spirit, we have a religious practice, God, Jesus, whatever it is, whoever we consider our, our wingman, our internal wingman, ask the question, super Kevin. Tell me what I am most aligned with right now. Is it pursuing trombone study or is it building the houses? And then just stay open and curious and see what information, see what answer comes to us. Because it could be like, all right, I, I'm really, I guess I'm really aligned with trombone. And then we go and we play at the Carnegie Hall and we're first, first chair trombone and we travel the world and everywhere we travel, we kind of go the Jimmy Carter route. Anywhere we travel, we just look for where we can help and how we can build homes. So, and that kind of goes back to the, like, we can have it all. It just might be a building, create mm-hmm. that foundation. And then we keep building towards that more holistic expression. 
That's an amazing way to put it. And I kind of wanted to ask you, because you said when we're in the doing, we kind of have our head down. Then we have to constantly check in and to see where are we so that we can realign and see if we're on the right track. Is, th is, there, is, there, is there a way for you to be doing while keeping your head up so that you don't have to constantly like look up and down and up and down, but you can keep making movement and progress while not worrying about whether or not you're on the right path. Is, is there a way you could do both? Yeah, I, I, I think that is just the practice of finding the flow state, finding the inner alignment and working to shift the scale of how often we experience that. Because a lot of times the flow state is like a perfect golf shot. One of those where you swing the club and you don't even feel it make contact, but the, go the ball goes dead straight a country mile. And it's like, oh, I want to do that again. How, like I, I wasn't thinking, I was just, it was just in the flow. It's just, I don't know how I did that. So it's kind of finding that state in which the doing is almost non-thinking. Like we're in the flow. So we're in the doing, whether it's creating social media content, whether it's meeting a new real estate client, whether it's getting home at the end of the day and being present for our families, as opposed to carrying work with us and being non-present. And so for me, it's the practice of just, again, not thinking, wake up and I've got an idea of what I'm working on today, what I'm focusing on for the week or the, for the month and the overall trajectory that I'm going at that 10,000 foot level, but I'm not attached to the outcomes. I'm in the process of the doing. And that's where the doing and the being start to overlap mm -hmm. because then we're in the being as we're doing. Mm -hmm. But that's still a process and a practice in and of itself. Yeah, no, definitely. I kind of think of like when you're hot in basketball and it's everything just goes it's, in. It's just, you can't miss, exactly, exactly. You can't miss totally. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, I had an amazing time getting to like learn a couple of these things that really just like shifted like how I viewed some things that kind of like blew my mind. Where can, if people want to like learn more about the, what it is that you teach and practice, mm -hmm. where can people get in contact with you? Where can we find you at? Yeah. So our website is radicalenlightenment.com. And that's going to be our, our online programs. That's going to be, I've written a book called My Guy on the Ninth Floor, which is, it's 180 pages, but it is dense. And it's really just a handbook for elevating ourselves, elevating our world, and getting to a place where a lot of the imbalances and a lot of the, the dis-ease that we experience globally can be eradicated with each of us going within letting go of all the crap we've been carrying with us. I call it the subconscious junk in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Get rid of all that, find our inner alignment so that we can find the being in the doing place. We can find that middle way more efficiently, more easily. And if we get knocked off of it, we can have more awareness of getting how that we can get back to that place more efficiently, more easily. Mm -hmm. Also work one-on-one -on -one with clients. We have transformation programs and we also have a membership where we do weekly transformation sessions in a mm -hmm. group setting, monthly workshops. And those are going to be at rapidtransformationsessions.com. That's amazing. And so, so those are, those are our two hubs. And we'll make sure to put all those in the show notes. Now it's time for our, our favorite segment of the podcast. Ooh. What is the most impactful lesson that you learned in life? Man, there's a, there's a ton that are vying for, vying for first place. But I, I think the, especially when we're starting off on this, on this kind of self-awareness reconnection journey with our wholeness, that recognition or understanding that I am not my thoughts, I am not my emotions, and I am not my reactions is a really powerful place to be operating from because it gives us that space of internal awareness. It's like the crack in the door. So I think that, that in, in and amongst a, a myriad of others, that's probably the, the one that's standing out most right now. What is the most admirable trait that you could find in a person? That's another good one. I'd, I'd say, yeah, someone who's practicing finding their inner alignment without impacting anyone else. And radical honesty is a really good way to begin to do this. If anyone wants to practice, a really easy way to do it is, is a starting point of practicing radical honesty, eliminating the words need to, have to, should, ought to, and trying from your, voc from your vocabulary. Eliminate them all together because those words keep us separate from ourselves and keep us subjective to influences outside of ourselves. 
oh, I really should do this. Oh, I need to do that. Where is that coming from? Where's the first time we heard that voice? And what is the thing that we're talking about? Mm-hmm. Nine times out of 10, it's some, it's a parent, it's a teacher, it's some form of influence when we're young that keeps repeating in our heads. So finding that place of radical honesty and, and inner alignment as we're practicing being kind and understanding and empathetic with everyone else in our world, because we're all in it, we're all doing the thing, we're all in it. I think that's yeah. one of the, the best places that we can operate from. And that's amazing. And so if you had to change someone's life with one book, what would you recommend? I would say Power Versus Force is a really amazing book. My I hope. believe Richard Dawkins is the author. The Field by Lynn McTaggart is another amazing book. It really dives into our electromagnetic resonance and the quantum reality of our life. So those are two pretty, those are two pretty powerful ones. And what is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? Peace on earth and abundance from within. This, this is a practice that I've been involved with myself for probably the last I guess like my wife, Kelly, and I started probably about 2015. And when I had my, well, I looked at enlightenment as the process of micro aha moments, those open and awareness times when, where it's like, oh my gosh, it's those epiphanies. It's those, those, you know, inflection points that either shoot us on a trajectory or maybe change our, change our direction. That's really a powerful place to, to be operating from. And it's, something where I came to the recognition, like anybody can do this. I'm just kind of grew up in Southern California, went to school all the way through, went to college, university, I got in a design career, got married, had a kid, kind of doing all these things. And then the universe threw us some curves and we, we zigged and zagged with it. And it's a place that every single one of us can get to. And when we get there for ourselves, that's when we start to transform our world. That's when we start to transform our residents. And a rising tide lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. So if we do for ourselves, we help to enable others to do for themselves. And we can also contribute to that doing in the process and be part of all of it. Well, that's an amazing way to end the episode. Kevin, I had an amazing time interviewing you. Thanks again for hopping on the show. Really do appreciate it. And I know my guests will definitely, my audience will definitely find a lot of value in this episode. John, I, I really appreciate it. Even from the first time we talked and I kind of l- looked back a little bit about you, what you were doing and what you're all about. I was like, oh yeah, this is, I, I, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>